Hello and welcome to New England Authors. So very good to have you here. We try to, buy, uh, to find the uh, experts in our field, and today we have such an expert, Dr. Scott Podolsky, who is uh, a professor of global health and social medicine at Harvard Medical School and director for the Center of History of Medicine at Conway Medical Library. So welcome to the show. It's Thank so you, good Tom. to have you. So we all know uh, what history of medicine is. Can you tell us what global health is and what social medicine is? Sure. So social medicine, I'm, I'm borrowing from my mentor, Alan Brandt's terms, where it refers to at least three components. There's the social production of disease, and this entails the ways that society is structured and the way that impacts who gets sick and when and how. It, it, uh, refers to the social meaning we ascribe to certain diseases and yeah. notions of responsibility, and it responds to the social response to disease, how we actually deliver care. When we get to global health, certainly there, there are artificial distinctions between the local and the global. I mean, certainly Cambridge is part of the globe, but at least in our department, it's a looking outward at, at the world and, and notions of social equity, making sure that everyone receives the same type of care that we could receive here in Cambridge or in Boston. Yes, yes. Um, uh, and we, we could talk all about this. I'm very interested in social medicine in general because we think of medicine as something individual. But uh, you have written a lot about uh, the history of antibiotic use and so on. So I, I really want to turn to that. And you have your earlier book here. It's called uh, Pneumonia Before Antibiotics. And, um, and you talk about how, how it covers the issues of therapeutic uh, autonomy, education, regulation, and innovation that led to your new book here, The Antibiotic Era, Reform, Resistance, and the Pursuit of uh, National Therapeutics. So how did, uh, how did you start studying this, and how did one book lead to another? Yeah, so, so the pneumonia book came out. I was a resident at the Brigham back in the late 1990s and seeing a therapeutic evolution going around me. And I was very curious in notions of the, the tempo and mode of therapeutic change. And I, on, on the bookshelf at the Countway at that time were, were two books. One was from 1937 called The Serotherapy in the Treatment of Lobar Pneumonia. Uh -huh. And the next one was The Serotherapy and Chemotherapy, which was the sulfa drugs in the treatment of pneumonia. Mm -hmm. And there was a sort of this notion that when the sulfa drugs came in the 30s and then the antibiotics in the 40s, there had been nothing beforehand. And not only had there been something beforehand, but the transition from that something, which was serotherapy, to the sulfa drugs was actually a negotiated and so slightly prolonged transition. So I took what started as, a, I thought, a very s narrow story, this treatment of pneumonia with intravenous antibodies and antiserum from the 19-teens through the 1940s, uh, and then expanded into very notions of how clinicians over the span of 30, 40 years actually decided when a drug worked, these sorts of therapeutic efficacy. Um, I got into notions of the relative domains between public health and private practice in determining how practitioners should practice. And this got into notions of therapeutic uh, education versus regulation of, uh, of our would-be autonomous providers like, like myself. Yeah. And that story led right into basically the sequel, which was about the antibiotics from the 1940s So onward. it's just been an, an evolving yeah. medicine. It's just been evolving sure. all the time. But the, the study of infectious diseases started when? Late 1800s or so. so, so certainly the advent of germ theory happens from the 1870s through the 1880s. Immunology itself begins by the 1880s. And there's this notion that nothing comes about to, to treat infectious disease until the 1930s and 1940s. But there actually was this period of, of applied immunology. It's quite advanced if we look at it in retrospect. Mm -hmm. Now, penicillin was discovered by Alexander Fleming in 1828 by accident. I, I know the mm -hmm. story. He came from va after vacation and found in his uh, petri dishes that s some mold had, had destroyed. Mm -hmm. the, but it, uh, penicillin wasn't really developed until World War II. Yeah. So what happened in between? Yeah, a lot happens in between. I mean, certainly the sulfa drugs come on board in the 1930s as the first real miracle drugs, as historian Jack Lesh has, has described them. But certainly people were looking for something less toxic and even more potent than, than the sulfa drugs. And people at Oxford, like Howard Florey and Ernst Chain, uh, developed um, Fleming's notions and started figuring out how can we make this, this, this penicillin on a, on a much larger scale. Yeah. And they struggled to do so. And then they actually come over to the United States in the midst of World War II. And this is sort of a parallel to the Manhattan Project, the right. development of penicillin, which entailed government and actual pharmaceutical company cooperation to create large-scale fermentation and really the rapid production of uh, penicillin to the point that 
where it was, its, lim its usage was very uh, closely rationed, 1942, 1943, by the end of the war, it was available for widespread use. Now, um, I, there, there was a, an exhibit uh, sponsored by Pfizer yeah. uh, here some time ago, and they credit themselves yeah. with being the, the founders of penicillin. How, how true is that? They do play an important role. I mean, yeah. Pfizer had been involved with uh, large-scale fermentation. It made vitamin C. It made a bunch of chemical products, but it was not making its own branded antibiotics until World War II. It becomes a major player with penicillin. Um, this interesting story about Pfizer is what happens thereafter. So Pfizer had gone from just being a chemical provider to making its own antibiotics. Right. But its, um, its president, John McKean, says in around 1948 to the New York uh, Board of Exchange, says, look, if you want to lose your shirt in a hurry, keep making penicillin, keep making streptomycin. These are these not patented. Yeah. We need to do or find novel patented, uh -huh. patentable antibiotics. And he does that with uh, teramycin, which was one of the first broad spectrum antibiotics. Uh -huh. And Pfizer then really revolutionized drug marketing. Uh, and, and that yeah. happens between say, 1950 and 1957. They expand from eight detail people, people who go to doctor's offices to tell them how to prescribe drugs, to 2,000 by 1957. Oh, I see. So, so, they were like sales salespersons. They were salespersons. So they do, yeah. they do play a key role in the advent of antibiotics in this country, but they also transform pharmaceutical marketing. Yeah, no, the, now the, the penicillins uh, uh, and the, the antibiotics were the, uh, the wonder drugs of that yeah. era. Yes. But right away, there was a determination to regulate them. Or, uh, or, uh, wh how, can you describe what happened in that, in that era? Yeah. They, they certainly are, I mean, and, and Robert Budd, who's a wonderful historian, has written a book about the degree to which penicillin literally rebrands modern medicine. You now have this really powerful therapeutic at, at, at your disposal. Uh, but there certainly were concerns about, there, about many as, negative aspects of the drugs, ranging from adverse effects, super infections, drug resistance, cost. Uh, and the question is, where do you regulate things? You mm -hmm. can either regulate individual providers or you can regulate at the level of the marketplace about which drugs get on the market. And at least in this country, this, uh, almost all the regulation happened at the level of the marketplace entry. Now, you use this phrase, uh, rational use. Yeah. Uh, that was a phrase that was, uh, yeah. was bounded around at that time. Yeah, we start seeing that already. I mean, it, it's been around for millennia, yeah. I mean, but certainly in this country, with respect to antibiotics, people like Ernst Jowitz in the early 1950s were using it sort of this notion of using the right drug at the right time um, and this notion of let's have a balanced notion of pros and cons of a given drug. Um, by, and, and it gets deployed um, by reformers on one hand, on people who think they're being reformed on the other hand. By the late 60s, you start to see all types of accusations of irrational prescribing, of, of overuse. And yeah. Antibiotics throughout their history really catalyze this, this identity of the would-be autonomous prescriber. Is that prescriber working rationally or irrationally? Yeah, so uh, we have, um, I guess I had the idea before reading your book, I had the idea that the uh, overprescribing of, of drugs was something new, yeah. but it's been going on for a very long time. Yeah, and I would argue it almost has to be understood like, a, like, a, like an embryo developmental biology kind of perspective, meaning from the very beginning with penicillin, especially the broad spectrum antibiotics, they were widely promoted as being basically the, these panaceas. Yeah. And so I would come to the doctor with my cold, I would get my antibiotic, I would get better, therefore my next, antibiotic, my next time I got a cold, I request it, and those, those cycles of request and receipt, and therefore second request and receipt, are already generated from the very beginning, and we're still, 70 years later, dealing with the consequences of that. Well, I want to talk about uh, today, but I, I want to go still <laughs> continue yeah. going back. Um, uh, there was a th uh, something that was called fixed dose antibiotic combinations. Yeah. Yes. Uh, what, what was that? That was yeah. around in the 50s. Was yeah. that uh, an idea to sell more drugs? Is that, is that what it was? It's, a, it's a really important part of the story. Right. And it leads to generalized change of, of, of the FDA that persists to this time. So you had penicillin coming out during the war. You had streptomycin coming out immediately after the war. And these were sort of narrow spectrum drugs. You then had the, the advent of what were called broad spectrum drugs that, that could affect all kinds of organisms, teramycin, quarimphenicol, oreomycin. But there was this perceived arms race that as soon as you had these new uh, drugs, bugs seemingly became resistant to them. And so fixed dose combination antibiotics were predicated on the notion that if we take an existing good drug and let's bring another drug that's coming up through the pipeline, perhaps a couple benefits will accrue. One, we'll get wider antimicrobial coverage. Yeah. Secondly, maybe this will be synergistic, more than additive. Uh, 
The problem was that, in the, and, so, and this became widely promoted, the FDA's antibiotics are, 1956 said, we're in a third era of antibiotics. Uh -huh. The first era was the narrow spectrum drugs, the second era was the broad spectrum drugs, the third era was fixed dose combination therapy. What, what, what year was that again? That's 1956. 56, yeah. That's Henry Welch who made that claim. But there was an important cohort of reformers, people like Max Finland at Harvard, yeah. Harry Dowling, who had been his first fellow, who was uh -huh. then at Illinois, who really resisted this. Yeah. They, they, they had studied these fixed dose combination antibiotics, and they found that A, yes, sometimes these drugs could be synergistic, but sometimes they could be antagonistic or less than the, some of their parts. And secondly, you just couldn't have a, a pre made variety of that drug. Um, you had to have this uh, done in the lab to see which strain responded to which drug, at least at that time. So they saw this as a real um, massive marketing by the likes of Pfizer, by Upjohn, yeah. around these fixed dose combination drugs. And they saw this as the advent of style over substance. And they felt they needed to counter something. They, they needed to counter this with something. And what they were going to counter it with was the, quote unquote, the controlled clinical trial. Mm. Well, uh, uh, this is uh, New England Authors. We're here. We're speaking with uh, Dr. Scott Podolsky, who is uh, a professor of global health and social medicine. And we're talking about antibiotics and antibiotics use. Now, you brought up uh, Max Finland. Um, that was very good. Uh, in 1954, he uh, argued that the individual physician no longer understood all the combinations of antibiotics at his disposal and that antibiotic combinations therapy uh, threatened to descend into chaos. He, uh, he became, in 1962, he became the first president of the Infectious Disease uh, Society of America, right? And uh, so um, he stood, he was in contrast with the FDA, right? Yes. Yeah, tell us about the yeah, story. Yeah, so, so this continues to fix those combination story. Right. So, so you have this rise of the infectious disease specialist, because you have all these antibiotics flooding the market, and somebody's got to tell you which one to prescribe at which time. And moreover, some of the old, uh, the old diseases like typhoid were already receding, and the ID specialists were the only ones who remembered what those diseases looked like. Yeah, oh, that's right, yeah. So you had this cohort of, uh -huh. of ID specialists who become reformers on one hand. You have the FDA's head of the, of the antibiotics, Henry Welch, on the other hand. And these reformers are seeing these drugs like sigmomycin, which is a fixed dose combination antibiotic, being marketed on the basis of what they thought were testimonials. So they'd give some, uh, someone like me 100 boxes of the drug, I would use it in 100 consecutive cases of like skin infection, everyone would get better. On your patient, you would prescribe it to your patients, yeah. yeah. And I would record this, they would report that, uh -huh. and these testimonials would be used to advertise the drug. And Finland said that, that, that the typical clinician is just being inundated with these kinds of lousy studies, these testimonials, with the advertising based on it, and they're losing any type of, of rationality. Um, so. Dowling, Harry Dowling goes before the AMA in 1957 and says, there's a famous talk called Twixt the Cup and the Lip. The cup being the, the crucible where drugs are being made, the lip uh, being the mouth of the patient. Uh -huh. And he says, what's happening with drugs is the same thing that could have happened with whiskey, with cigarettes, we're just advertising it. And you're gonna lose, and the pharmaceutical industry is gonna lose its credibility, and the medical profession is gonna lose its credibility, and this entire notion of rational therapy is gonna come crumbling down. Finland counters this with says, what we need is the controlled clinical trial. We need something to tame the therapeutic marketplace. Exactly, yeah. At, yeah. at that point, the FDA at least explicitly only adjudicated drug safety. It did not explicitly adjudicate drug efficacy, although scholars like Dan Carpenter have, have written, it was doing this implicitly. This is where things are at, say, 1959, when Senator Estes Kefauver from, from, from Tennessee right. begins his hearings, and this is where the antibiotic story intersects with the history of the FDA. Now, uh, the, the, I'm glad you brought that up. And so in 1959, these Senate hearings began, and uh, it really changed uh, the, the whole um, uh, government involvement in medicine. Right? And a lot, uh, a lot of people, including doctors and, of, co of course, pharmaceutical companies, yeah. really opposed uh, the government being sure. involved in this. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so what, what happened? How did, how did the Senate change things? Yeah. So the 1950s had really been the wonder drug era of right. pharmaceuticals. Uh -huh. Not only did you have antibiotics, but you had steroids, minor tranquilizers, antidepressants, antihypertensives, all during this era. Was, but they were becoming expensive. And Keith Alver, uh, who was this liberal senator from Tennessee, he had taken on the mob in the early 1950s. He was Adley Stevenson's running mate in the 1956 oh, election. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, oh. yeah, he's fascinating. Uh -huh. In fact, he's, uh -huh. he's the senator in the beginning of The Godfather, too. 
who was, who was taking on the mob at that time. So oh, by, by the late wow. 50s, he applies this notion of administered prices, the notion that uh, the marketplace was not responsive to, to, to changing demand um, to the pharmaceutical industry. And so that his hearings um, were originally going to be based on mostly on pricing and patent concerns. But what happens is in 1959, as soon as these hearings are about to happen, that whole intra-professional debate about antibiotics becomes, uh, which happened in the, within the sort of hallowed sanctuary of, of medical journals, leaks out into the, the public press. There's a, there's a uh, science editor at the Saturday Review called John Lear, uh -huh. who writes an article called Taking the Miracle Out of the Miracle Drugs. And he speaks with, with Finland and a lot of his, his colleagues and exposes all this, this over-marketing. Right. Kefauver staff gets a hold of this, and among other reasons, they start moving the hearings much more towards marketing concerns. And it comes out during the, during the hearings in early 1960 that Henry Welch, the FDA's head of uh, antibiotics, had basically been on the take throughout the 1950s. Really? That he was getting 7.5% yeah. of all uh, reprint kickbacks to him. He was getting a certain percentage of all advertising to the point where he made about uh, $285,000 in 1950s money, which was oh, a lot that of money. Oh, that was like millions. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, yeah. And, uh, so, and so the FDA, he's forced to resign. The FDA convenes a committee that says, you know, what should we do? And they, this committee basically says, look, the first thing you need to do is start adjudicating drug efficacy based on adequate and well-controlled studies. The, over the next two years, the, the key fiber hearings kind of wind their way through government. The entire thing's about to fall off the table. And then in 1962, thalidomide breaks. Yes, yes, that had a profound effect yes. on, on, on it. Yes, yeah. so, so um, JFK and, 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 and the Senate felt they had to do something, and so they do pass the Kefauver Harris Amendments, the drug, federal drug amendments of 1962, with mandate that new drugs enter the market on the basis of adequate and well-controlled studies. And what, uh, can you tell us what constitutes that? Yeah. What is a well-controlled study? Yeah. We're speaking with uh, Dr. Scott Podolsky. So it took about another seven years to figure that out. So there's a sort of this, this, this conventional history of, of, of the clinical trial that we go from sort of nothing through strep, the study of streptomycin in the 1940s, which was done on the basis of randomization and blinded evaluation. But really, I'd, I'd like to think of it as a, as a social history of the trial, that it, that it comes around in, as a result as in not only for these um, epistemic reasons, but because of these social reasons to tame the therapeutic marketplace. Mm -hmm. So when you have the Kefauver hearings, uh, uh, I'm sorry, when you have the passage of the Kefauver amendments, yeah. the FDA is left with a big problem. What does it do with the almost 4,000 drugs that are already on the marketplace? Yeah. Um, and what does it mean by well-controlled trials? Exactly. So by 1966, the head of the FDA, James Goddard, reaches out to the National Academy of Sciences, National Research Council, and says, can you give me a bunch of experts to help me evaluate every drug that's on the marketplace. And they do, they form about 30 panels to evaluate all these drugs based on these, these, these new definitions of well-controlled studies. Yeah. By early 1969, they, they decide that every fixed dose combination antibiotic on the marketplace is quote unquote irrational and should be taken off the marketplace. Upjohn sues the FDA. Um, and in the course of those hearings, James Goddard's replacement, Herbert Lay, is forced to define what we mean by adequate and well-controlled studies, and basically says it's, it's a double-blinded, randomized controlled trial. And if you don't do it that way, you should have a good reason for that. Otherwise, yeah. that's the new standard. Uh, and that really gets, um, uh, that winds its way all the way up to the Supreme Court, which finds in favor of the FDA. Really, yeah. Uh -huh. And this, this, this is a um, ma major inflection point for, in, in several ways. Number one, it's really the, the, the apotheosis of the controlled clinical trial in the history of American pharmaceuticals and, 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 and American medicine. Um, it's a radical empowering of the FDA to shape and unshape pharmaceutical marketplaces that it retains over 50 years later. Um, and, or, and then it, um, it ends a particular moment of, of antibiotic reform in that these reformers over the, from you know, 1950s through almost 1970 were able to get what they deemed irrational antibiotics off the marketplace. But what they couldn't do was control the usage of those antibiotics that were on the marketplace. Yeah, so yeah. They, could, they could control the marketplace and the FDA, but they couldn't control the individual prescriber. Oh, I see, I see, yes. Uh, Dr. Scott Podolsky, the numerous uh, doctors overprescribe antibiotics, while at the same time the benefits of drugs are exaggerated by, uh, um, uh, by the drug companies. Uh, can you comment on, uh, being a doctor yourself, can yeah. you comment on the overprescription uh, of the drugs? Yeah, I think 
first of all, I do. I, I, I get it, and I probably do it at times. And I'm a, I'm a primary care clinician myself, and if you're faced with somebody with, say, a sinus infection, on the one hand, you know that rationally, I don't think these antibiotics are going to work for it. On the other hand, I don't, this, I don't want this to be the one time that some sinus infection takes a hold and hurts my patient. So you're, oh, you're forced with this uncertainty. Right. Um, and that's, with that uncertainty, years of marketing and, 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 and culture certainly do take over. Um, I think we're faced with decades and decades of history around this, that these patterns of the profession identifying itself with this powerful um, therapeutic at, 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 at hand. Um, it almost helped re-identify the profession from the 19, late 1940s onward. Mm -hmm. And you just have these patterns of receipt and expectation. So that mm -hmm. even my patients who, might, who I inherit say, look, doc, these, these drugs have worked for me for, for decades. I don't want to be the first one. You know, I don't want yeah. to be the first time that we don't use it for this. Yes, yes. So it, 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 I, I, I sympathize. Mm -hmm. so, so, but uh, also, um, on uh, we've all seen uh, advertisements on television yeah. about the drug companies. And um, they, they paint an almost romantic picture mm -hmm. of, of it. And I think uh, doctors, uh, would, you, would you back this up? Doctors uh, don't like those advertisements <laughs> because patients come to them right. and they don't even have that particular ailment. Yeah. Uh, would, would you agree with that? Yeah, I, I feel mixed about that, especially with respect, because there are very few advertisements for, for, for antibiotics per se. Ah. Um, I mean, with, with, with respect to whether doctors are educated by, by pharmaceutical advertisements or not, that, that goes back even well before patients were ever being advertised by the, by the pharmaceutical industry. So, ah. so let's say it's the 1950s. At that time, quote unquote, ethical advertisers could only advertise to physicians. They ah. couldn't advertise to the uh -huh. public at that That's time. That's right, yes. And they did it, it, was, it worked very well for the pharmaceutical industry. They had a captured market of the 100,000 or so physicians in this country, and they absolutely um, flooded them with advertising of all sorts, whether, whether this be direct mail, journal advertising, uh, and especially drug detailing. And these, uh, it, one of my favorite parts about writing this book was going down to the National Archives and seeing these, um, these plans on, on drug detailing in the 1950s, where they were, they were conducted like, like military campaigns, and they were uh. um, described in the language of combat, where uh. you'd say, like, one half is going to blitz Birmingham, the other half is going to blitz Memphis, we're going to meet up in the middle and move on to the next place, <laughs> and it's, it's remarkable. Uh. And um, I, I don't think docs have anybody to blame with themselves for um, advocating some degree of their, of their education to, to the pharmaceutical industry. But also, is it, isn't it uh, true that most antibiotics are used uh, for animals, uh, uh, chickens and pigs and cows and so on, and they're not really used f to control disease but to promote uh, growth? Is that true? It's a, it's a very important parallel story that I give relatively short shrift to in the book, but other historians like Robert Budd and Klaus Kershell uh, have written wonderfully about this, right? So by 1950, Leaderly was already finding that oreomycin was not only useful in people, but when you added it to pig lots and, and, ch and chicken feed, it improved growth. And that uh, led to decades of expansion of, 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 of the um, animal husbandry industry and really a transformation to gigantic lots. Um, and we're still contending with that today. Mm -hmm. um, certainly by, by, by tonnage, the vast majority of antibiotics in the world are being consumed uh, for, 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 for agribusiness. Whether that pertains, to, whether the degree to which that contributes to antibiotic resistance in humans that we care about, is tougher to say. I see. I see. Well, let's go to today. Now uh, we have a lot of uh, antibiotic-resistant bugs around, and they're. Uh, I, I quote from the World Health Organization that um, these resistant pathogens are quote one of the biggest threats to global health unquote, and it's occurring all over the globe across social and economic classes. And the WHO says um, that uh, it is increasing, the, uh, the rate, the number of, of uh, drug-resistant bacteria is increasing. Uh, are we doomed? Yeah. I don't think we're doomed, yeah. uh, but, but I think it's a more complicated story. Okay. So, so on the one hand, you can go back to 1954 and see people saying, if we keep doing what we're doing now, we're going to get to the end of antibiotics in 10 years, in 20 years, soon. Um, and here we are 65 years later, and we still have antibiotics, at least for the vast majority of what folks like me see in primary care. On the other hand, it's daunting that despite people having concerns about antibiotic overusage and misusage and resistance, 
I've been making statements for, again, for 65 years about the need to collaborate in our response to antibiotic resistance. It really hasn't been done uh, on, a, on a large global scale to this point. And I do think it's an issue. I mean, certainly there, there, there are certain um, drugs which are extraordinarily alarming, and there's plenty of places that could be, uh, there's plenty that could be improved in confronting antimicrobial resistance from the very need for better surveillance uh, and laboratory infrastructure to actually determine what resistant bugs are arising where, uh, to being able to have improved sanitation, vaccination, mm -hmm. um, to obviously um, uh, reducing the usage of antibiotics in agriculture, to incentivizing new drugs. I'm all for all of that. Um, and also, you know, getting back to the very first question around global health, these questions of, 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 of excess, of overuse, also raise issues of access. There's some parts of the world that don't have access to antibiotics to, to treat the most basic of, of infections. Yeah. And so, ultimately, I hope this story points to these larger upstream determinants of who gets sick in the first place and improving the structures of both how we live and, and how care is delivered globally to help uh, promote a more rational usage of the therapeutics in, in general. Well, that was a great place to end. Okay. Dr. Scott Podolsky, who has uh, got this wonderful book called The Antibiotic Era, uh, really enjoyed reading it, uh, enjoyed having you on the show and, and talking about this, this wonderful issue. Uh, this is uh, New England Authors. Uh, we, brought, we record here in Cambridge and broadcast around New England. Remember, watch locally. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa.